Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of a webinar that I am hosting called The Role of HVAC Systems in the Transmission of COVID-19. Um, and this month's edition, I'm going to be joined by Dr. Stephanie Taylor, in addition to Dennis Knight. And uh, Stephanie's going to talk to us more about the medical side of it and add some value uh, to our discussion. First, uh, let me just go over a few housekeeping tips for those of you who may not have done this before. Um, this is a, a webinar, so we're delivering uh, content, slide material content, and we'll be taking questions via chat. So in your GoToWebinar little panel that popped up for joining this session, there's an area where you can add questions. So um, at any point in time, if you'd like to just type in a question, I will field them. I have the question and answer session up over on the right-hand side of my display. And I will try to pick it and hand it off to the correct person to be answered. So uh, that is how we'll run opening mics in this kind of situation. It doesn't work very well for a variety of reasons. So if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. We'll try to answer them as we go. So let me do some introductions. As I mentioned, we have Dr. Stephanie Taylor with us today. Um, Stephanie has a very interesting background. Um, Harvard physician, Harvard trained, Harvard Medical School, went on to get her master's in architecture. So she, uh, like myself, is multidiscipline. Um, I'm both mechanical and electrical, and she's uh, medical and, and, uh, and architecture. And she's uh, quite involved with healthy buildings, and in particular, healthcare facilities. And uh, she is with us. She's also on the uh, epi Epidemic Task Force for ASHRAE, as is Dennis. Dennis is with us as well, again, this, this, this uh, month. Dennis, as many of you know, is uh, Society Vice President for ASHRAE. He's an ASHRAE Fellow. Um, uh, both of these people are distinguished lecturers, so I'm really thrilled to have them. Dennis uh, founded a company called Whole Building Systems, and uh, he's on the Multidisciplinary Task Group as well. So welcome, Dennis. Welcome, Stephanie, to our program. Hello. Uh, myself, Paul Bemis, I'm the president-elect of the Granite State chapter. My background is mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. I worked in computer design for many years, uh, first building them. Now I have a small company where we do software for caring and feeding for those servers in data centers. So we do data center design, which is dominantly airflow modeling. Uh, I have a background in computational fluid dynamics, and I worked for many years for a company called Fluent, who was the leader in that market. So we'll bring fluid mechanics into this discussion as well. Now, I'm going to do a level set here because many of you in the audience today were not in the session last month. So I'm going to do a little bit of level set here, back up, and just cover some ground that have already been covered in our last webinar, just to make sure everybody's at the same point. Most of the discussion about the transmission of this disease, uh, COVID-19, is uh, based on sciences that date back to the 1930s under a fellow named William Wells. And this had to do with tuberculosis transmission. So a lot of this information we hear about uh, six feet distances and uh, staying apart from one another and breaking the model up into small and large droplets with a cutoff limit dates back to the 1930s. There is much more recent work that has been done by a variety of people on this that are concluding that this is really a multi-phase event. This has uh, got all kinds of uh, phases in it. It's a liquid phase, it's a gas phase, it's a solid, solid phase as well when someone sneezes or coughs. It is turbulent uh, and there is more and more evidence that the distances of, of effect how this will affect one another is quite large, up to the range of 27, 30 feet. Furthermore, we know that the, the, the pathogen is, is influenced tremendously by a variety of components, such as temperature, such as humidity, which we'll talk more about today, and, and airflow, because once it becomes an aerosol, uh, it stays suspended in the air for a long period of time. Humidity plays a, a key role in this process. Um, and Stephanie has some experience with humidity and uh, the effects of humidity in the healthcare environment that we're going to talk about in a moment. So these things have a tremendous amount of effect. Now, recent studies conclude that, uh, that uh, talking and speaking can also project a pathogen into the air. 
We've seen some super spreader events that have been caused by people in a choir, for example, singing. And so in the last session, we talked about super spreader events. We had on the show a person named Jonathan Kay, who had, he works for a company called Quillette, or at least that's the uh, publication. You can go there and have a look at this. He studied super spreader events and found that the dominant amount of super spreader events were caused by close activities, activities such as funerals or choirs or their close range face to face. In fact, of the ones he could categorize, over 70% of them occurred in close quarters, almost all indoors. So when you see these breakouts going on here in the United States, you see them on the news, um, the thing that uh, I, I always wonder about is what is the environment in which transmission is going on? And the evidence so far suggests that it is largely inside, indoors. It is a concentration effect that's causing this uh, transmission to occur. And since our last uh, discussion we had last month, there's even more evidence. And now there's reports concluding that airborne transmission is the dominant route for the spread of COVID-19. This came from a National Academy of Sciences paper. The interesting thing about this is they used data based on, it was empirical data they used based on the reaction that each country had in the world to uh, the effect of COVID-19 and the actions they took to mitigate it. And by comparing those methods, they were able to determine that uh, the dominant route is, is, uh, is airborne transmission. The other thing that's become clear is the infection period where you're most contagious is actually a couple of days prior to symptoms occurring, which makes this thing particularly dangerous because you don't know you have it. You don't know somebody else has it. And they're estimating that nearly half of COVID-19 cases are spread before symptoms appear. Uh, that the virus production is in fact strongest at the beginning. And furthermore, that the patients that are producing the virus are producing at a rate much, much higher than was seen in SARS earlier, up to almost a thousand times uh, more production than was there with SARS. So this one's a killer uh, for a couple of different reasons. One, we don't know it's there. Number two, it's airborne. And number three, it's producing much more than we ever thought. So what I'd like to talk about here, and I'd like to bring uh, Stephanie into the conversation to do this, is uh, transmission mechanics, what I call transmission mechanics. So we're going to talk about the viral load itself, the definition of viral load, how it can start in the uh, respiratory system. And I put up this, uh, this image right here. Stephanie, to kind of describe it, we have a situation where it's a multi-phase event. Some of it is here coming in as droplets and, and hitting contact. And we know that it can be transmitted through contact. We know that these droplets can, can hit someone else. And that's why there was the six foot limit to try to keep um, these parts of it from hitting someone else. It's, this is a bit of Newtonian mechanics here. They call it trajectory analysis in the Newtonian mechanics. It, comes out like a bullet and just drops and falls. But it's the aerosol one that I'd like uh, you to spend a little time on. Talk about the aerosol transmission and how it manifests itself inside uh, the respiratory system. I'm gonna pass the control here over to you. You should get a signal now that you're sharing your screen or can share your screen. And if you could uh, pick it up from there, I'd appreciate it. Great, <clears throat> can you hear me? I sure can, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Paul, and I'm and to all the listeners. I'm really honored to be here. Um, I have to say, I'm I'm always a little anxious when I'm talking to uh, or with such smart engineers, since I'm primarily a uh, physician. But as a physician, I do get really excited talking with uh, building professionals, so architects, engineers building managers, because I firmly believe that that with this COVID-19 pandemic, and actually with many diseases, that the, the building professionals really have the most influential position to protect uh, human health. So I'm excited to be here. And so focusing on uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that um, is causing the COVID-19 pandemic, 
you know, we have to take a look at this in history. This isn't our first pandemic and uh, is not going to be our last, most likely. And if you look at these, uh, these three really noteworthy plagues, so the bubonic plague or the Black Death, uh, the Spanish influenza, and now COVID-19, it's interesting because all of these pandemics were caused by viruses in the same general family called single-stranded RNA viruses. And the reason that this is important is that this category of virus mutates really rapidly. And with each mutation, there's a new uh, possibility that a virus will occupy an, an environment that we've created that has vulnerable hosts, such as us human beings without an immune, uh, without immunological defenses. So mutating viruses uh, are really what we have to try to control in our buildings. And, and speaking of uh, this virus, this is the SARS-CoV-2, the mutation has led to a couple of unique characteristics, and some of those Paul already uh, discussed or mentioned. One of those uh, characteristics is that the, the, this tiny, tiny virus is able to adhere to our tissues kind of deep in our lungs. Um, the coronavirus, which is the, the family of this virus, causes 30% of the common cold. But this mutation has resulted in a viral strain that not only adheres deep into our lungs, so people who get very sick often present to our emergency department in fairly severe respiratory distress fairly quickly. Um, and furthermore, the if you can be infectious without even knowing you're sick. So several days can go by where you're carrying the virus and you're not even aware of it. So this asymptomatic carrier phase is what uh, is one of the things that makes this very difficult to track and um, and quarantine people before they have released a lot of viral uh, particles into the air. So let's just take a look quickly. If this person, uh, this is this uh, this video is done by uh, MIT. But if this woman is sick and she has the audacity to walk into your home or office and she coughs without a mask on and you're standing kind of nearby, what building influences are going to determine whether or not you're more or less vulnerable to getting sick? So if if she comes into your office and here you are uh, sitting there working at your computer, what happens to those droplets? When droplets are immediately released from your airways, they come out about 100 microns in diameter uh, in about a 100% humidified environment of your respiratory tract. Once they're released into the air, those droplets shrink very rapidly. They desiccate to reach moisture equilibrium with the ambient air. So for example, if your office is at about 45% relative humidity, um, that droplet will come out and it will shrink down to reach equilibrium with that degree of water vapor. And, and furthermore, as, it, as those particles uh, persist in the airborne environment, the size and the concentration of the stuff in the droplets will be determined by your ambient humidity. And Paul started this, this uh, this webinar talking about the Wells-Riley equation. Well, we used to think that the particles in that little droplet all the way over to the right, the, the white and the red, we used to think they were inactive we, because we couldn't grow the particles, the microbes in tissue culture. But subsequent to uh, the Wells-Riley equation, which is actually very accurate, we just have to get the inputs correct. We now know that the particles in those droplets are often dormant. And so they're still infectious, but we don't see them in tissue culture. But the, the, in, the awareness that we now have dormant viral particles has really revolutionized what we know about the importance of the built environment in managing disease. And it also has highlighted indoor air management as a disease uh, uh, containment tool. So let's just say, what are the, say that woman's walked into your office and coughed, where are the steps that we can intercept the spread of COVID-19? The, the column to your left, so she comes in, uh, coughs. That's not really an engineering, um, that's nothing that engineering can really uh, control unless you've locked your doors. That's a behavioral intervention. 
Then we have the transmission through the built environment, which is the center column. And then you have the vulnerability of the secondary host, and that would be you. When we usually address those characteristics with things like vaccinations, um, effective treatments, you know, eating well, getting sleep, getting exercise. So let's take a look at each of these stages very quickly. So I'm supposed to have 10 minutes. So the first step, again, the introduction of a viral load into your building um, or prevention of that is usually done by behavioral interventions. You know, we've been told to stay six feet apart. That's with the presumption that uh, transmission occurs either through direct contact or through short range spread of large droplets. As Paul said, we now know that uh, that's only part of the story. We also have enough evidence to uh, know that we need to manage our indoor environment to contain longer distance spread of smaller aerosols that can contain the virus. And here are uh, two recent papers. One, um, uh, Lydia Moroski said, the world should face the reality. Uh, we do have airborne transmission of this virus. And furthermore, another paper says, not only do we have it, but it may be the dominant route of spread. So we need to manage our buildings with that in mind. So how can we do that? And what are what indoor factors actually um, do we have data to support uh, as a tool for management of uh, disease transmission? So we can look at uh, aerosol transmission within the building. We can look at how effective surface cleaning is, or and we can look at the actual influence of indoor air management on the, the activity or the virulence of the virus. So my work began, my work in this area, right after I graduated from uh, architecture school in my late 40s, which was an experience, but I began to look at how the hospital building might influence all these infections that people can get in the hospital. So a group of microbiologists was looking at all of these different parameters in patient rooms in a brand new hospital over about 13 months. So I found out about this study and said, hey, I'd really like to look at patient outcomes in those rooms. So we, uh, they said, okay, sure. So we collected uh, lots and lots of data. We had about 8 million data points from the room. We had about 300 patients, sent this data off to our statistician who came back to my surprise telling us that relative humidity was a very important uh, indoor air factor that correlated with infection rates. So on the left, in the winter time, we had high infections, low relative humidity in the patient rooms. Throughout the summer, the relative humidity in the hospital went up, uh, infection rates went down, and on into the next winter, you can see what happened. I was uh, suspicious of this, I thought, They've missed some variable uh, flu season or something. So we fired our statistician. We got a new one who said, no, this is an independent variable that's very uh, impactful. I was still skeptical, embarked on another study in, uh, in a nursing home. This study is over four years. We looked at indoor climactic factors and infection rates. And once again, we found that when the relative humidity was less than 40% indoors, not outdoors, but indoors, especially respiratory and gastrointestinal infection rates were high. And once the indoor relative humidity was uh, came up to 40%, from 40 to 60%, we had a, the, the sweet spot for the lowest infection rate. So when you think about the COVID-19 um, deaths in nursing homes, this is, this is really important. But those two studies really just look at correlation because we didn't have a parallel control. This study, uh, the third study and the last that I wanna talk to you about is a good study um, because it does have a, a parallel control in the building. So this is a study done by the Mayo Clinic in Northern Minnesota in the winter time. So probably similar to weather to New Hampshire and where I live in Vermont. Half of this one school was humidified to 45% um, January to March, and half of the school was not humidified. So cold air was brought in, warmed up, relative humidity plummeted. So this group 
looked at the number of airborne particles carrying, uh, in this case, influenza virus. They looked at how active the virus was. And most importantly, the, they looked at the number of children who missed school from influenza. And as you can see, in the green row at the bottom, where the, which reflects the part of the school that was humidified, you have fewer airborne particles carrying the virus, so the air sort of settled out, and the actual infectivity of the virus was decreased and sort of follows that the number of children absent were, was fewer. So that was influenza. This is a study looking at coronavirus and inactivation in varying degrees of relative humidity with comfortable indoor temperatures. On the bottom you have in the x-axis, you have days, y-axis, you have a logarithmic uh, viability scale. And you can see that with the black line at the top, when the air is dry, you have slow uh, inactivation. The green line shows 80%. So outside of that 40 to 60% sweet spot, you have inactivation. But at 50%, which is the mid-range and very comfortable, we, had, we saw the most rapid inactivation of the coronavirus. So that's the middle column. That's what my research has shown. Uh, Paul and Dennis are going to talk to you about other indoor air management strategies that are very effective at containing um, viral transmission, pathogen transmission. But before I hand the mic back to Paul, I just wanted to show you one more piece of uh, information which talks about how the indoor environment can actually support the immune system of the rest of us indoors we would be the secondary hosts. So again, this is with influenza A. This study was done at Yale um, about a year ago. And Dr. Iwasaki's lab was investigating the, the actual physiological mechanisms that make us more vulnerable to getting uh, seasonal viral infections when, when the indoor air relative humidity is low. So why is it that when we're hanging out around 50% relative humidity, if we're exposed, we might get sick or a little bit sick. But in the wintertime, when the, when the air is dry, that's when we really can become clobbered by uh, the flu. So this, this study was done in, in genetically engineered mice because you can't really take out people's lungs and chop them up and look at them under the microscope. You can't do it too many times anyway. So they used mice. So let's just take a quick look. What happens when you inhale or you're exposed to viral particles in your, in your breathing zone in the building? So that lady comes into your office, she coughs, she puts those particles into the air, and you run the risk of inhaling them. The first line of defense is a layer of mucus that lines your respiratory tract from your nose all the way down into your lungs. And within that layer of mucus are these little hairs called cilia that are constantly washing upwards to try to help your lungs not be exposed to particles. The cilia exist from about your trachea down into the secondary branches of your bronchial tubes. So the cilia are constantly waving upwards, trying to keep stuff out of your lungs. If, if one of those particles does happen to settle down into a deeper part of your respiratory tract, these cells come in, our body makes macrophages and dendritic cells, I love the name macrophage, like a big eater cell. Macrophages gobble up any particles that can get deeper into your lungs or into your respiratory tract. These cells also make proteins called interferon that are very protective to your body to, again, help you not, uh, not get a, a bad infection. And if necessary, other aspects of your immune system are activated. The thing that's really interesting to me is that, again, looking for my part at relative humidity, Dr. Uh, Iwasaki's lab found that when the indoor, the ambient air relative humidity was around 20%, that all of these mechanisms in your, in your respiratory immune system are impaired, and yet they're optimized at 50%. So not only is the mucus thicker and the cilia can't work, but you, our bodies don't produce the same amount of interferon, and the secondary part of your immune response is, is much slower and less effective. So I think this is exciting because it just shows you that the in the managing buildings and indoor air management, as well as surface disinfection, 
um, and choices of materials and spatial design not only affect the air and the surfaces, but they also dramatically can, can influence our own physiology. So again, my premise that the building profession uh, is really in charge of protecting public health is founded on a lot of scientific data. So I say thank you, and I'm here with my little dog, Luigi. <laughs> thank you so, so I much. Have, I have a couple of questions for you, Stephanie, to come right out of that. And now, one of the fundamental questions I've always had about this, I'm so thrilled that you're here, is we're, we're not all the same with respect to this. Am I correct? In other words, the dynamics you just described of the respiratory system and the lungs and so forth vary from person to person. So the viral load for you may be different for, than for me in terms of getting the disease, correct? You mean the the infectious dose needed? Or, yes. The viral yes. load is more or less the same, but the infectious dose would vary. The infectious dose would vary. So in a room with the same concentration of, of pathogen, um, not everyone's going to get it. Some will and some won't, depending on the concentration, I would suspect, correct? Depending on the concentration and depending on their own physiology. But yes. you're right. Not everybody is going to be equally susceptible to the virus. Now, the other thing that I, I simply wanted to point out there is we were talking about humidity. And you talked very clearly and concisely, I enjoyed it, about the about the respiratory system and humidity with respect to our physiology. I, I was not even aware of that because my primary thought was the reason the humidity is, 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 is a dominant characteristic has to do with the fact that the pathogen is becoming light and becoming attached to dust particles and so forth and floating and living in the environment for so long. But I, I suspect they're both true. It's both situations, right? Actually, it's all three. So the first the, the component that you just referred to, which is, I think, the number of particles in the air, which is based on their size and uh, weight. So there'll be fewer particles in the air, in the breathing zone with this mid-range humidity level. So that's one. Two, and this isn't, this isn't consistent with all viruses and bacteria, but many viruses especially are actually inactivated when you have a certain, that mid-range of water vapor in the air. And we don't know why or how that occurs. So if you figure it out, Paul, let me know. We'll go to Stockholm together with the <laughs> Nobel Prize. Yes. So we don't know why mid-level relative humidity inactivates some viruses. So that's number two. And number three that you just mentioned, that mid-range of, of relative humidity actually supports our own respiratory immune system. Mm -hmm. But back to your point, if a person, for example, smokes cigarettes or has uh, certain lung diseases or other medical uh, problems or even physical characteristics, such as if you're a nose breather or a mouth breather or what is the shape of your sinuses? Uh, you know, different people, people in Alaska have different uh, sinuses than say people in the Sahara Desert. So indigenous populations actually have modified, evolution has modified their, their sinuses and their turbinates to, to treat the air prior to it reaching your lungs. So different people have different levels of vulnerability to uh, infectious particles. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. What I'm going to do now, and, and to sort of couple to that, I'm going to take a look at what um, the environmental parameters in a building can increase the probability of transmission. This has more to do with the design of the building itself and, 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 uh, and how it's put together and how it operates. To do this, um, I'm going to do some sensitivity analysis. We're going to do this with computational fluid dynamics again, because it, it is a great uh, way to illustrate the outcome of these events. Now, sensitivity analysis is something we do in engineering design a lot. Uh, if I was designing um, anything, gas turbines to, to automobiles, I would be interested in what are the sensitive parameters of design? Is it, uh, and, and what I mean by that is which parameter of the design has the greatest effect on outcome? Um, often we do something called design of experiments where we, in simulation, look at a variety of parameters all at once to determine which one has the most sensitivity to change, to outcome. And then that's the dominant parameter we design around. We can do a similar thing here 
in buildings where we can do some sensitivity studies to understand the effects of different parameters. We did this for the presentation today, and we're going to use it as a way to find out which parameters are, are dominant. So sensitive in analysis, we're going to analyze a few key variables. What we're going to do today is look at these five. Uh, we've already talked about relative humidity, and we haven't quite modeled that one yet, so that might be a future um, a webinar. Today, we're going to talk about air change rates. We're going to talk about position of inlet outlet diffusers. These are the inlet uh, where the air comes in and outlets where the air goes out. Every room has to have a pair or, or at least have inlets and outlets so the air can flow through the room. Uh, partial versus full occupancy we're going to look at. We're going to look at local air filtering as well. So let me get started with that. Now I'm going to be using um, this model that we had before. This is a model of an office. This is in fact a model of one of the offices we use for, for um, doing analysis. And I'm going to show this to you uh, both in 2D and 3D. So uh, one of the ways that I think shows best and what I got fairly good feedback from last time in our webinar is to be able to show this to you in three dimensions so that you can see how the air flows. The great thing about fluid dynamics is it gives you the opportunity to see air. Now these are what are called cassette um, uh, diffuser uh, sets or systems. They have a return here in the middle, which is brown, and they have supply on the outside here. And I'm showing you just supply. So what I'm showing you here is the air coming out of those diffusers and into the room. Its mixture in the room, or how, how well it uh, mixes the air in the room, is a function of their position and, of course, their flow rate. Position has a, a fairly important effect. You notice that, for example, right here in the triangular region of this, if I tip this around and show you that on top, you'll see that in this section right here, there's not a lot of air being blown into there. It's blowing out over in this section and blowing over in this section, but there's none here. So just because I have a certain number of air change rates in a room doesn't mean I'm getting all of the air in the room. And this could imply that I have a higher concentration of something like a pathogen over here than I had before. And in fact, that is true. If we take a look at here, now I'm looking at what we call a contour planes. This is a a single plane. Uh, this one is located at 0.5 meters above the floor. And what we've done over on the left is leave the diffusers where they were earlier, the actual position of them. And you notice, as I mentioned, there's a bit of a, a dead zone. What we call the dead zone in uh, clean rooms is where we don't have a good mixing of the air. Over here is not good. Now, what we're assuming here is that all of these people are emitting something out of their mouth. We don't know that it's contagious at this point, but we do, we can see through the, through the simulation that there's a high density of exhaust particles over in this region of the room. Uh, now, what we've done here on the right, and I can show you the, uh, the same model with a shifted pattern, we've shifted those diffusers over to the right. Same exact model, same exact conditions but you see they're shifted. And now by shifting them, you can see these people over in this region are now getting some pretty good air. I mean, it may bounce off the walls, but at least it's coming down into the room. Where what's happened is over here on this side, not so much, and now they're not getting air over here. So positioning of diffusers sometimes reminds me, and I've seen this in clean room design that we, we analyze as well, that this Reminds me a little bit of the game, the children's game of whack-a-mole, where you, you knock down one little, I don't know what they are, little vermins or something, and then another one pops up and you continue to try to, try to hit them to get them complete. You have to continue to try to move these around to get the mixing in that room to be completely uniform. And that's often what happens. So here you see it's now cleaner over in, in this region of the room where, where we were having trouble before, it's now cleaner but not so much over here where we've moved the diffusers away. And in the next set, I'll just move up. I've just moved up now to 0.8 meters. So I'm higher in the room with the same plane showing you concentration and color. A red is high concentration, blue is low concentration of matter coming out of people's mouths. And uh, here again is one meter, and here we are at 1.1. This is about where the mouth is located. And you can see it coming out and, and, and mixing around in that room. So location uh, does make a difference. The trick is knowing how to optimize it for a given room. You basically need to model it, I think, in order to know exactly the impact it's going to have. 
Now here in this next one, what we've done is something called, we've called clean room style. So what we've done in this design is we've now changed it so that the air comes in from the top, but it goes out on the side. This kind of approach is used a lot in different designs. It's definitely used in clean rooms, and that's why we called it that. But it's also used in hospitals, Stephanie. You'll, you'll, you'll see this in operating rooms where the air comes in like this, goes down, and, and goes out a side grill. In fact, there was just a very good article in this month's Asherick Journal where they did a, a very detailed study on this in, in a few hospitals. And they're showing that position of these outlets and inlets is very important. You, you want fresh air to come in. Uh, you don't want it to pass by the patient and then go to the attending physician and then out because they'd be in the path of any kind of possible pathogen. But the arrangement of these uh, devices, uh, inlets and outlets, diffusers, is important and it's also complicated by many factors, including who's responsible for the positioning of them. Dennis, I think you and I see this all the time in, in design where the people who are responsible for the placement of the diffusers is often uh, architecture or, or, or often it's up to the, the people doing the installation themselves. It's certainly not modeled a lot. Uh, and, and, and historically that has been okay because it's been a thermal issue we've been facing. The issue is, is always from an HVAC point of view, been thermal. Uh, are you hot or are you cold? Here, we're talking about something fundamentally different. We're talking about pathogens. We're talking about health and safety. So the positioning of these devices and the relationship of mixture in the room is much more important now than it ever has been before, uh, before this point in time. It's a health and safety concern now, not just a thermal issue. When it was thermal, we could overcome it. Some people are hot, some people are cold, put on a sweater, it's no big deal. Now we're talking about health, health and safety, and it becomes much, much more important. So here is another cut. This is just at 0.88 meters. And then again, here is at one, one meter. And you see that uh, there is a difference. Um, you know, that the positioning did help, for example. Uh, over here, these people are in better shape than, than over here. So the clean room didn't help the people in the middle, but it helped others uh, over in this section. So again, uh, positioning of diffuser is important, but it is not um, the dominant characteristic. Now let's take a look at change rates. Here we're looking at the change rate itself of air. ACPH stands for air changes per hour. And what we did is we went from our normal design over here on the left where we were running at 10 air changes per hour and we dropped it by uh, 50%. So over here we're, we're looking at five air changes. Look at the difference in concentration. So here it is at, at 0.5 meters. Here it is at 0.8 meters. Uh, and here it is at uh, one meter. The concentration levels are extremely high because the change rates are low. So here you have stagnant air. It's not being changed often enough. Interestingly enough, air change rates is one of the easier things to measure. You can do it with a bolometer. Uh, test and balance people do it all the time when they commission buildings. You simply go in. You can even do it with a volometer, an airflow measurement device. You don't have, doesn't have to be a a volumetric device like a bolometer, it can be a volometer where you're just measuring velocity. And as long as you take it in the same position at each diffuser and multiply by the area of the diffuser, you can get a rough approximation of what's coming into the room. Air changes is extremely important and having the correct number of air changes in a room appears to be one of the dominant parameters of design for, uh, for pathogen transmission and concentration. So here it is at mouth level, 1.3. Pretty scary stuff over here on the right at five air changes. Now, we also went the other direction. We went to, we went, okay, so this is just a sum of the of the four uh, side by side. So here we are at the upper left at 0 0.5, 0 0.8, 1, and, and 1.3. Now here what we did is we went to 15. We moved it up by 50%. And again, here on the left is our standard case. This is the one that we ran originally, and you see the, uh, the issue over here in this corner as it originally was in the first set that I showed you. Over here, what we have is just really looking quite good. All we did was increase the change rate. Now, the issue of whether or not you can do this is dependent upon a few different things. The HVAC system itself, does it have enough flow volume to be able to, to handle this? Furthermore, in this design, we're also assuming that the air handler has enough filtration 
to be able to take all of the pathogen coming out of the room and filter it sufficiently so that it doesn't get reinjected into the room. In other words, we're assuming 100% transmission elimination when the air gets sucked out of the room. That's a fairly substantial assumption. Uh, it is not true if they're just simple recirculating uh, devices that uh, do not have filters in them. And these assumptions are, of course, the air is being filtered. Uh, the current recommendation is to get to MERV 13 or higher, and uh, we'll talk a little bit with Dennis about that uh, towards the end, what the ASHRAE recommendations are. Now, no filter units here, local filters. We, we did another one here uh, with filters, and uh, I want to show you that one as well. So uh, in this scenario right here, we took a look at local filters, and we did this in the last session too, so you may recognize this. Here, what we've done is added in local filtration. There's uh, six of them in this uh, design. Uh, one is over here, and there's uh, two, three, four, five, five, six over here. And at 0.5 meters above the floor, again, this is our base case over here on the left. Over on the right is the same exact situation with filtration. We're assuming here the filtration is quite good. It is at least MERV 13, if not HEPA level. It is, it, is, it is enough to trap the pathogen in the filter and not let it come back out of the local filter. But you see that looks very good. It looks as good uh, effectively as it did when we increased the, uh, the change rates by 50%. So local filtration does work and uh, it can be a major uh, improvement to the, to the situation. So from the parametric variations that we uh, ran, we, we find that air change rates is very important for, for, for proper health and safety. Uh, this is very consistent with the Imperial College study that we reviewed in the last webinar, which was showing that if you can get the change rates up to the specified level, it is as effective as vaccinating 60% of the population of the students in the room. That was done at a high school in the United States. Uh, Penn State was part of that study with Imperial College. The air does need to be filtered by the air handler to be effective. And one of the issues we all face is, does the air handler have enough pressure to be able to handle the higher concentration or the higher filtration rate caused by the MERV-13 filter? Higher filtration does cause higher pressure drop, and that is an issue in terms of the design. The alternative is local air filtration, a very good option when, when uh, changes to the HVAC system are not possible or prohibitive in cost. And, uh, and, and that's what's uh, coming out of the sensitivity. Location of inlet and outlet is, is third on the list. It's not as important as the other two. Um, uh, we did not know that until we did the studies, but it, and it can be important depending on the situation. Um, so, so Dennis, I'd like to bring you in on this uh, a bit because you've had some experience with this. I think you're dealing with a situation now. I wanted to point this one out in particular because this is one you showed last time where we have over here on the left a, uh, a, a air handler unit sitting on the wall over here on the left and then over on the right is the outdoor view of that and so this this is the inside part and the outside part um, so first of all what were you i think it was probably good to hear that the air change rate is the dominant uh, parameter because in fact that is the ashray recommendation for for, for one of the first steps anyway, is to get the air change rate correct. Yes, um, <clears throat> well, thank you, Paul. And uh, I tell you what, before we dig into this, I'd, I'd really like to ask you a question sure. uh, based, based on your previous uh, slides. So uh, a, a, a comment or a question, uh, the Epidemic Task Force now has answered about 518 questions that have been submitted. And when it comes up over and over again, um, and we talk about it a lot, is recirculation versus 100% outside air. And then the other thing uh, with that is we, what's often tagged on to it is the use of ceiling fans. And uh, we, uh, that debate is still out. I, I think we've, we've all kind of come to the conclusion that a well-mixed room with good filtration is best. And I, I think you're, your uh, presentation shows that. So if you've got a room that's not necessarily well mixed, I mean, uh, people all, always ask, do we do we run our ceiling fans? Do we turn them on? What should we bring box fans into the room? And, um, 
I, I tend to lean against the box fans. I think ceiling fans can aid in, in uh, increasing the mixing in the room. And uh, as long as you got good filtration, and then I think you demonstrated bringing in some supplemental HEPA filtration uh, when that's not possible is good. So I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on on well, the ceiling fan issue. We do know that dead zones or, or zero velocity areas are not good because that's where things collect. I mean, even in our own homes, you always know the zero velocity, what we call the dead zones, because that's where all the dust collects. You know, it's under the table, it's wherever it is. The dust collection in your room is a result of zero velocity. And so particulate tends to go there because there's generally a small vortex there and there's, there's a, a low pressure in the center and that causes it to accumulate. So I would uh, argue without running uh, any kind of study, I would argue that um, mixed a mixed room with with forced circulation even if it's a fan or or a ceiling fan or or a box fan would be better than nothing however i can't tell you whether a ceiling fan would be better than a box or not without you know the problem dennis is it becomes uh, it becomes specific to the geometry. problem right it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's specific it's, to the geometry of the room we face this in clean rooms a lot where the equipment in the room itself causes local local vortices and local uh, eddies to occur and, and can cause contaminant to accumulate. And until you know what the room looks like, much like the one you have here, the study I just showed was a much better designed room than this one because this one has inlet and outlet way over in the corner of one side. Right. And it's going to recirculate. The issue with this one is it's going to, you know, recirculate right on itself. It's going to go around. It's going to want to do this right there in that room and i have gone into the rooms i mean uh, uh, other than it keeping most of the airflow and toward the you know the back half of a classroom or whatever and i just i look at so many school districts in the southeast and there's just literally thousands of these uh, even my local school district we've got close to 2000 systems like this um, in, a, in a district with about five to six thousand classrooms mm -hmm. um, is I've measured air velocities uh, coming off the, the supplier grill across the room, and they they stay fairly high. And just as you showed with your your I guess your coenda effect or whatever with the mm -hmm. ceiling diffuser, the the air velocity stays high all the way across the ceiling. It drops off as you drop down lower and lower to the occupied zone until it actually does hit the wall on the other side of the room. But it does stay concentrated at the back and uh so, i wasn't I mean, so much worried about you know this direction i'm okay there because right. it probably goes in and out like that right that's right that's exactly what it does but what i'm worried about is over here i mean you right. know, that's uh, that's a real big dead zone okay yeah, yeah. so um i mean our recommendations in, in these situations have been the supplemental hepa filters um right uh, possibly, uh, in, in some cases, we come to these units, even though most of them are being changed out with, with units that bring in a fair amount of outdoor air, even better than 62.1 uh, recommended rates. So we are getting some dilution. Mm -hmm. uh, the portable uh, HEPA filter units and then uh, recommending reduced occupancy in these classrooms. These are only about 650 square feet. Uh, and uh, normal occupancy is about 24 people, which is a fairly high density. Uh, now, let me ask you a question, Dennis, time. and, and yeah. Stephanie both. I mean, this, we, taught, we had an early discussion about humidity and how important humidity is here. But, um, you know, we, we run into issues with high humidity as well. You know, there was some, you know, the, the, I've heard the old term, uh, you know, any humidity is too much humidity. Do you know what I mean? From an HVAC point of view, because it causes problems. For example, um, you know, vapor barriers uh, on these buildings is particularly in cold climates like like Northeast. The vapor barriers are often often aren't exist don't exist. I mean, I doubt this building has a vapor barrier. Now it's now this building was built in the 50s. You, I can yeah. guarantee it doesn't have a vapor barrier. So you run humidity up, and and you have problems with rot. You have problems with fungus. Um, so you know the humidity. I wasn't aware until today when Stephanie pointed out that humidity has as much to do with human physiology as it does with with the vaporization or buoyancy of the pathogen. Well, you know what? This is Stephanie speaking up here. Um, Paul and Dennis, you're right. If, if a building doesn't have a vapor barrier and 
if the insulation is such that you have thermal bridges in your envelope or you know under cold pipes and you're going to have a condensation when you reach the dew point with warm humidified air hitting a cold surface or cold air it's absolutely true and that's not a, that's not good but the solution and sometimes it would take a magic wand to create this solution the solution is to properly insulate the building so that you know you have a good u value to prevent the water activity from reaching point eight where you get condensation i realize that's easier said than done especially with existing buildings but it, another um misconception that i just wanted to bring up is that many people think that mold uh, that fungal organisms are hygroscopic that they can extract water vapor from the air and use the water molecules for growth or for survival and fungal organisms are not hygroscopic unless you reach about a 80 percent relative humidity so if you have humidity you're not going to have mold per se if you have liquid condensation of water you will and if you don't have a if the insulation is uh doesn't prevent the dew point from being reached they could be one in the same but um so you would argue in that case, uh, Dennis, I'd love to hear your opinion on this as well. Yeah. You would argue in this case that you would uh, put up with condensation on a window and frost on a window for, for health purposes, right? I mean, if you had a case where, you know, we're operating in the Northeast, like, we're, like you and I are, Stephanie, you and I are, and it's cold out and we're seeing frost on the window, better to leave the humidity where it is than turn it down because the argument you're making is that the building itself is probably okay. It's just inconvenient and, and not attractive to see frost on a window, but but it's probably better than the alternative. Well, that's not exactly what I meant, Paul. What I mean is that you don't want uh, condensation in interstitial spaces. Of course. But the, the way to not, you know, one way to have to achieve that is to have great insulation. Right. Um, but if you have frost. And the way, um, yeah, the one way we combat it, and we do a fairly good job. What I mentioned was we, we changed a lot of these units out with newer features, all of them. Uh, and, and, and we're in warm and humid. We're sitting right on the coast uh, right. and almost tropical. And uh, what we do is we're, we're, we're almost in a dehumidification mode 12 months out of the year. So uh, we do, we do overventilate in some cases, but we, we always try to maintain a positive pressure in the room and uh or at least get to neutral when the building's uh, really leaky um and uh, we set our limits on our humidity at about 55 percent is when we start getting alarms and in 60 we we really send somebody out to start uh checking out the equipment but it's a rare day that we get humidity below 40 percent except in the mm -hmm. you know a few days maybe in late december early january but uh we're we're running uh, in the cooling mode after about nine o'clock in the morning most of the year, and wow. uh, humidifying almost all the time. So uh, now, Stephanie, have you faced resistance in in the healthcare industry and in, in hospitals and so forth to increase humidity? Do you do you face any kind of resistance there? Well, in hospitals, uh, Paul, there's lots of resistance around pretty much anything. Um, first of all, it's a, it's very difficult to get data. Um, it's difficult to uh, have hospital C-suite people really want to discuss improving infections because they don't feel comfortable revealing their current infection rate. So hospitals, unfortunately, are very difficult places to uh, instigate change. Nursing homes, on the other hand, um, don't have the same penalties by CMS for their infections. So nursing homes have been very, uh, have been a lot easier to work with than hospitals. So yes, there's resistance in hospitals, but it really begins at a higher, at a more broad uh, level. Um, but I did want to mention, so I live in Stowe, Vermont, northern Vermont, where it gets very cold in the winter, you know, minus 15 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. So this is not a study, but uh, my husband and I finally humidified our home, a combination of steam and evaporative. and he used to get a lot of uh, influenza and stuff in the winter. We've humidified for four years and neither neither of us have been sick once, which is really, again, it's not a study, but it's been a very good 
bit of currents. And uh, in, in occasionally we'll get some frost on our windows. I don't worry about it too much um, because it dries up pretty much, you know, by noon. Right. My, my seven dogs love it because you can pet them without shocking them every time. Our right. piano stays in tune. So it's been very possible for us to uh, at least humidify to 35% in the wintertime. Yeah. All right. Now. Just just for to finish out here, Dennis, this is a slide that uh, that uh, was in our earlier uh, program. I thought it would be important for you just to uh, because you're uh, on the on the task force and and sort of leading some of the communications here. This is for our audience. What what should they be doing? Would you like to just uh, review? Yeah, I'll just do that. And uh, and then also uh, I'll go ahead and plug that uh, Monday afternoon. Um, you go to the ASHRAE website, uh, myself and Wade Conlon and Sarah Maston from the uh, uh, the Epidemic Task Force and from the Building Readiness Team are, are, are doing a full hour on uh, uh, using your HVAC systems to mitigate the spread of uh, infectious disease, but uh, primarily talking about uh, creating that building readiness and systems evaluation plan and how to implement it uh, either during a during a, a pandemic or when your building's been shuttered and how to start a building up some real real important issues so uh, some of the major tenants that the task force has, has always taken of course is you know do no harm but uh, start out by you know uh, determining whether you can increase the amount of outside air which you know in turn helps your dilution rates uh, uh, followed by if that's uh, you've done as much as you can there, but still can't quite get you know something equivalent to MERV 13 filtration or better, try to try to increase your filtration rates. And then uh, finally, if you're in the situation just like I sh showed you in the in the classroom where there's not much chance of putting a a MERV 13 filter on it, and because you're in a warm and humid climate, I really can't increase my outdoor air very much. Uh, then look at supplemental air cleaning uh, and primarily installing HEPA filter uh, units more than anything else. And then uh, then cautiously looking at the other air cleaning technology. Cautiously well. looking, because one of the questions yeah. that come in, of course, you you, <laughs> you saw our president was uh, speaking at a church and they had come up with an ionization that they guaranteed the ionization would eliminate uh, any chance of COVID. Um, what are your thoughts on ionization? Yeah, yeah, I was just looking at a presentation before I got got onto this one, and um, and it's uh, I think um, you know there, there's an AHR AHR test standard out there on some some residential air cleaning devices that uh, goes back a ways, and it it, it primarily is focused on the production of ozone and there's a UL certification that many of these devices have that state that they don't produce ozone but uh, most of the um, I guess the science and the literature on, on, on some of these other air cleaning devices outside of UV that's been around for a long time are, are, are been primarily generated by the manufacturer nothing wrong with that um, and many of them use the same type of technology, be it bipolar ionization, you know, uh, needlepoint, um, um, electrostatic precipitation, and, and those things. It's just that in many cases, the manufacturers all have their proprietary way of putting things together. So all, all, I, all I can say there is that we, we don't necessarily know, and to do your work, and Depending on the manufacturer, just ask ask for what you know what studies they've done, what testing they've done, and also uh, you know query them on has there been any independent studies, independent laboratories, and and even even better uh, you know third party uh, independent universities and, and researchers that that have nothing to do with the product and, and how you know how long it's been tested and you know how many samples were taken and how many different installation con and conditions it was tested in so exactly uh, i just uh i just approach all of that with with an air of caution and and um 
buyer yeah. beware. And that's correct. And and just do your homework. That's that's now. Awesome. What about UV? UV's been around a long time. Now there's um, LED versions of of UV. How yeah, we... and I'm not uh, I'm not familiar much. I, I know Bill Bonflip is a is a renowned expert on it. Stephanie may have more experience, especially in a hospital atmosphere. UV. Um, we use them a lot to clean coils. Uh, UVC radio um, light is is particularly effective, but again, uh, you know, we always talk about single pass, and I think UV has been demonstrated in in the right conditions to be able to uh, disable a virus. I won't. I try not to use the word kill because uh, there's a big debate as to whether viruses are alive or not. And, uh, but uh, disable a virus or kill a bacteria. Uh, on a single pass, and that's what you you like to do, or either capture it on a single pass, which HEPA filters are able to do. Uh, but the uh, LED UV, the near UV, far UV, the thing, the other things you're hearing again, it's it's like other air cleaning devices. I think do your homework, um, talk with the manufacturers, find out how it's been tested, where it's been tested. And uh, Stephanie, what would you think? What would your opinion be on that? So, so Dennis, I I think you and I are in the same uh, thinking the same way. UV uh, irradiation is not my primary area of expertise. I think that it, but having said that, I think there are certain situations in which it can be very beneficial. Uh, you know, like in duct cleaning of coils. I agree with you that you need to be cognizant of the the dose of wavelength that's being delivered. Um, UVC lights aren't like incandescent lights, they're not on and off, so you need to really be careful about the maintenance so that you're not bombarding the particles with suboptimal doses. My one concern that we really will take years to figure out is whether or not by using UVC without effectively dismantling viruses, that's a great term, or killing bacteria, are we are we at risk of creating an, another type of superbug viruses or bacteria that are actually resistant to shortwave light? Because we're seeing some of that coming out of the ISIS space station. Um, so however we use it, we need, to, uh, we need to be careful. We need to clean up the particles through filtration. And we need to really take be aware of the data that, that uh, backs up design and purchasing decisions. I agree. So, I, I rarely the see it. I think it can be good, but be careful. Sorry. Go ahead, yeah, Dennis. I just, yeah, I'll just say I, I rarely see a case where I I wouldn't uh, combine, I wouldn't at least have, you know, MER 13 or better filters in combination with, with UV, uh, again, to clean up those particles and, and, uh, and, 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 and stop, from, stop them from being recirculated in, into the environment. So. I think that's absolutely absolutely essential what you just said there, there is also a, a deposition i'll call it a deposition time isn't there stephanie with respect to uv in other words the the, the pathogen has to be or the virus has to be exposed to the uv long, for a long enough period of time to kill it i would think or to disable it to, to be exact you're yes. right I, I looked at a, yeah. an analysis the other day and the duct would have had to have been something like 600 yards long for it uh to uh to have had enough exposure time to yes to exposure time disable a, a, a virus. I, I think that, you know for cleaning coils and and things like that it's probably excellent. I have reservations about other applications, but those reservations are really more based on my hypothesis than on uh, solid research on my part. Mm -hmm. Oh, like if you the, careful yeah. human exposure to UVC because it can damage your eyes and your skin. Mm -hmm. so you be careful about that. There, there is an excellent webcast by by Bill Bonflip that's posted on the ASHRAE website, just specifically related to UV. If 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 the attendees are interested in it and where the applications are are best and 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 what types and what wavelengths uh, mm -hmm. are the most appropriate uh, and I would I would steer anybody to that that uh, webcast to uh, 
to get some information on it, as well as our filtration and, and disinfection um, part of the website. Um, mm -hmm. Take a look at it. It's just uh, it's just not something that I've applied a lot. Okay, great. Uh, we've come to the top of the hour. We're a little bit over, but uh, we covered quite a bit of material. And uh, I'll have contact information here if anyone wants to reach one of us. I want to thank you, Dennis, and, and you, Stephanie, for joining our program today. And uh, uh, if there's anything that I can do for either one of you to help you, please let me know. Well, thank you so much, Paul. And Dennis, it's been absolutely wonderful working with you for this uh, webinar. Same here. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Paul. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye now.